are live. Hello, everyone. My name is Matthew. I am one of the um, course instructors uh, for the uh, Coursera courses and Udemy course. My apologies for the delay in starting today. We had some technical problems that we uh, had to track down due to some construction work that's going on in our building. Um, I will hand this over to you, Chris, uh, to welcome everybody, and then we'll get started with questions. Okay. With no further ado, let's get started. Uh, uh, live sessions for the astronomy MOOCs, and the floor is open for your questions. All right. The very first question is from Pakornan, uh, who says, um, Good evening. Uh, could you tell us more about the discovery of water on the moon and its implications for the future? Yeah, so it's not a complete surprise because we've already had indications of water on the moon. There are uh, sort of shadowed, heavily shadowed polar regions of the moon which have seen water. There's a famous uh, Shackleton crater um, where in the shadow, in a perpetual shadow of that crater, there are ice deposits. That's been known for some years. Uh, this is the same sort of thing. It's ice in the bottom or along the sides and rim of craters. Uh, at mid-latitudes in the moon. Uh, it's modest amounts, but it's definitely ice, ice mixed with rock. It's not just pure ice sitting on the surface. Um, and it's a non-trivial amount, so it's an interesting amount because it means if you made a moon base in the region where there's this ice nearby, you can actually get water um, that would be a valuable commodity for any moon base. Um, the next question is from um, the world of science uh, who would like to know if you could talk a little bit about uh, what is quantum entanglement um, and is, they're particularly interested in what uh, do you say about the quantum entanglement of light? Uh, quantum entanglement is a, a technique, it's a technology almost of the lab um, where you can create uh, entangled states, that is states where there's coherent information shared between two states, and these can either be states of a particle, subatomic particle like an electron, or states of a photon. Um, and what that means is the, is the information is contingent, that is the state of one, one of the photons, say, or one of the particles depends on the other, uh, and it's held between them. And so uh, it's, it's coherent information, and the interesting thing about entanglement is it seems to be instantaneously held across a distance, not transmitted at the speed of light. Uh, and so there are methods in the lab to entangle photons, that is to, uh, to split the information between photons so it's coherent. Or with particles, you can have a spin-up, uh, spin-down pair creation process where you entangle the two states, uh, and therefore the coherent quantum information exists. Um, so quantum entanglement has been demonstrated in the lab multiple ways. It's been demonstrated to apply over distances much larger than the lab. I think the record is something like an uh, intercontinental scale between an island uh, in the Caribbean or an island off the coast of Africa and a European lab, so thousands of kilometers. Uh, and the question becomes, could entanglement exist on cosmological scales? Not clear. But entanglement is an interesting uh, idea in quantum theory. It's an interesting technology because you can use it to do quantum computing, to do quantum cryptography and all sorts of interesting things. Um, the next question is sort of related. Um, can you talk about, uh, Red and Misha would like to know if you could talk a little bit about quantum computers. What are they? Why are they interesting and useful and particularly for astronomy? So the limitation of computers is that they tend to do their operations serially. So computers just are handling extremely large numbers of ones and zeros, bits, binary digits, and they're processing them uh, at, with blinding speed. But even then, given advances in computers, that blinding speed doesn't let you do everything you might want to do. Quantum computing is a way of uh, letting a computer do its calculations in parallel, so that instead of one stream of manipulations of bits, you actually have manipulations of what are called qubits, or quantum bits. And a quantum bit is an entangled state, which means the information, the one or zero, is held between two states. And so you can have an intermediate state that's not pure one or pure zero. The ability to have coherent uh, quantum states or qubits means you can make code that does calculations that runs in parallel uh, according to the number of qubits involved. So qubits are a way of 
parallelizing code in computing and increasing the speed of computers beyond their incredibly fast rate. The problem and the limitation is the technology to create qubits and computers based on them is still fairly primitive. So I think the record is something like a hundred or a few hundred qubits uh, held at usually at very low temperatures um, in that state, in that entangled state. Uh, that's not nearly enough to make a practical computer. But this is early days, and so people really do believe that within a decade or maybe 15 years, quantum computers will certainly be in the research arena, and they may eventually enter the consumer realm as well. Next question is from Pat, who's on with us live. Um, Pat would like to know, how do we know that 1% of the noise on an old analog TV is cosmic microwave background radiation? Right. Well, that, that's just an estimate. I've seen that various places. I think I've quoted it myself. Um, the, the idea there is that the, uh, the, the old-fashioned TVs, which are getting increasingly hard to find, are based on cathode ray tubes or sort of modern versions of cathode ray tubes. So an electron gun that's firing at a phosphor screen and illuminating colored phosphor dots if it's a color TV. Um, so these phosphor dots it, uh, can also be activated by radio waves or microwaves, and so that's the principle involved here. So if you have uh, a radio, a TV set that's not accepting signals from a real source, uh, then it's going to be showing uh, some noise, some just standard electronic noise uh, in the phosphor. And those phosphor interactions and speckles, if you like, of about 1% of them will come from interactions with microwave background photons, which are all around us. There are hundreds of thousands of these photons, but very low energy in every breath we take. Um, but of course, we don't know about them because we don't detect them directly. But a, a TV set phosphor tube can detect them. Uh, the next question is from Heaven Licious, who is on with us uh, live as well. Um, and I'm going to kind of guess at what they mean. Um, the question is, what would happen if we put a human organ on the moon or just out in the galaxy. So I'm guessing they mean what would happen to human tissue or to a human body mm -hmm. if it was left out on the moon or just out in, in space? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, human tissue, the human body and human organs, say, or skin, anything, uh, left in an extreme environment like space or the surface of the moon uh, will suffer intense damage from radiation. So, you know, space is filled with cosmic rays and high energy radiation. A lot of it comes from the sun. Uh, most of it is not reaching the Earth's surface because of the sheltering effect of our atmosphere for the UV radiation and the Earth's magnetic field for the cosmic rays and high energy particles. Uh, so, absent that protection, uh, tissue or uh, cells will really take a large amount of damage uh, from that kind of radiation. I mean, the other problem, of course, in extreme environments is the vacuum itself. Um, so a human body in a vacuum, basically your blood will boil very quickly uh, just from the low pressure and low temperature. And so that's why a person, a human person, couldn't survive that condition for very long at all. Um, we have a couple of people um, who are saying that my sound is a little quiet, so we're going to work on that. Um, but for now, perhaps you could just repeat the question. Um, so the next question is from Wendy, um, and uh, Wendy would like to know, if and when a graviton is discovered, can it be considered an analog of the Higgs boson? So the question about a, is about a graviton, and might it be an analog for a Higgs boson? Um, so a graviton is a hypothetical particle that carries the gravitational force. So even though we don't have a theory that unites gravity and the other fundamental forces, Physicists have analogized the carrier particles for the three other forces, uh, which are gluons, the Higgs boson, or oh, sorry, the uh, W and Z bosons, and the photon, to a particle that would carry the gravitational force. And it's called a graviton. In the standard model of particle physics, it has spin two, uh, and it is moving at the speed of light to carry gravity. Uh, it's not directly analogous to the Higgs boson, because the Higgs boson is a mechanism for inducing mass in fundamental particles, whereas gravity is a force that operates between masses. So really the Higgs and a graviton are quite different uh, beasts in terms of the standard model of particle physics. Excellent. Uh, the next question is from 
um, Jim McLeod, who has a question on astrobiology. If one of the labs trying to create life um, in vitro is successful, um, the, how does that help the view that random chance on early Earth could have the same success? I think uh, if lab experiments to create life um, are successful, it will be a good indication that there's no mystery or surprise about life forming on the Earth and therefore the uh, conditions that apply there might apply elsewhere and so life might not be rare in the universe. If lab experiments make, find it extremely difficult to generate life, then that might be an indication that life on Earth was a fluke or depended on very unlikely circumstances. Now currently those experiments are not very far along in the sense that they have not traversed much of the real estate between the simple molecules that we know are on the early Earth and the very most primitive cell in the earliest forms of life four billion years ago. There have been some steps along the way. Uh, there are primitive protocells that can be created from fatty materials in a solvent in water. Uh, there are mechanisms within those protocells or fatty tiny cells to uh, concentrate RNA fragments, sometimes on grain surfaces, which are substrates with lattices, which allows you to template and replicate and then build up the RNA to something like a thousand atoms. That's nothing like the RNA that first coded life, but it's some steps along the way. So those experiments in vitro creation of uh, life have been successful enough to give an indication that it is going to be eventually possible to do this in the lab and therefore the conditions on the earth that led to it are unlikely to be unique to the earth. Excellent, thank you very much. The next question is from Marietta Phoenix, who would like to know, is there a limit on how many hours someone, a human, I assume, can stay on another planet? Uh, it depends on their circumstance. It depends on their level of protection. I mean, if they're in a completely sealed environment uh, and if they're dealing with you know, significant gravity uh, so that they're not in a zero gravity situation or very low gravity situation and they have sufficient food, air, and water, then they could survive indefinitely and live a natural life. Um, however, generally, people in these kind of environments are going to be subject to other kinds of stresses and they may indeed be because of a high radiation environment because it's not possible to protect them fully um, or the effects of different gravity from the earth, especially lower gravity than, than the earth, uh, can induce um, obviously bone loss, muscle loss. These things have been seen in astronauts in Earth orbit for over a year and they would be the case on people living on a planet. So there are adverse medical effects of living on most planetary surfaces and the effect of all of these is going to be to shorten human life. Um, all right, the next question is from Chandran, who's on with this live. How long will it take for, say, a 10 solar mass black hole to completely evaporate away based on Hawking's prediction? And is there a way to calculate something like that? Uh, there is. I don't keep that formula in my head. For a solar mass black hole, that time I do know is 10 to the 65 years, and one with 65 zeros after eight years. And that uh, time will obviously increase with the mass. I can't remember if it's linear, though. So it's something in excess of 10 to the 65 years, maybe 10 to the 66 years. These are such large numbers that they're essentially meaningless anyway. And we should remember that Hawking radiation has not been detected. So it's just a theory at the moment. And I don't know how accurately the experimental prediction even is, let alone the fact that we don't know how to test it. Um, so Hawking radiation is an extremely slow way to dissipate and evaporate a black hole. Um, this one is kind of a cultural astronomy question. Um, Product Inquirer would like to know what mysteries still remain, if any, about the origins or purpose of Stonehenge? Um, there are still mysteries about Stonehenge. Stonehenge is, you know, from my homeland. I first saw it when I was about eight years old, I think, growing up in the UK uh, in a nice time before it was ringed by concrete fences and had car parks and gift shops and all that. It, it was much more atmospheric 
when I was growing up because it just sits in the middle of Salisbury Plain and you just come upon it on the road sitting there silhouetted against the horizon of fields and sky so it's pretty spectacular uh, now it's a huge tourist attraction of course numbers are limited it's not quite as pristine as it used to be you're not allowed to go inside the circles anymore as well which I remember doing when I was young as far as what we know and don't know about Stonehenge there are still some mysteries um, and most of them stem from the fact that the cultures that built Stonehenge between about 3500 and 1500 BC uh, these are prehistoric cultures or pre recorded history culture, so they had no written language, they left no records or documents for us to understand, and so we have to guess at the meaning of them building Stonehenge, which was a prodigious undertaking for these sort of Iron Age people. Uh, enormous amounts of planning were required, stones were moved a large distance, the techniques to lift them and align them were quite sophisticated and involved in a huge amount of work. We know that Stonehenge in, at base is a uh, cultural, religious, and astronomical uh, work. It's not a strict observatory in the, uh, in the sense a scientist would say. It obviously had extreme importance culturally and for religious reasons in those cultures. It was a gathering point for people from hundreds of miles around. The mysteries about Stonehenge involve, of course, the true nature of its purpose. What set of people was it built for? What type of ceremony and gathering and did they do there? And what were they talking about when they did it? What was its cultural purpose? Astronomically, there are still some questions, too. And then some of them from the fact that the outer, smaller stone circles are incomplete, and many of those stones have been moved, lost, destroyed over the centuries. Um, so there may be astronom astronomical alignments or other astronomy codings built into the organization of Stonehenge that have just been lost because the stones are incomplete. So that's one of the big questions. Uh, there are alignments that people argue about. So there are alignments where not every archaeoastronomer is convinced they have an astronomical meaning. And, and there's a problem because without a written record and an intention of the builders, you have to use statistical methods to somehow infer that an alignment was done deliberately. And when you're looking for lots of different kinds of alignments, then clearly you can find alignments by chance, and you have to decide whether what you found was just an accident or by chance, and not an intentional alignment. So that's the source of much of the argument and debate about Stonehenge right now amongst astronomers and archaeoastronomers. The next question is from Jorge Christ, uh, sorry, Kitrosser. Uh, who would like to know, uh, could you comment on the current status of the OSIRIS-REx problem-solving attempts? Last week, we talked about how they were leaking material um, through a stuck uh, uh, door of some kind. Right. Uh, the OSIRIS-REx uh, sample gathering process was generally very successful in that they, uh, as they gathered their sample, they very clearly exceeded the minimum bar they'd set of 60 grams. Uh, and you could see that in the video that's been posted online where you can see uh, the blow and then suck process of touch and go stirring up a huge amount of cloud of particles and debris and pebbles and so on. They were a little too successful in the sense that one of these larger uh, stones got stuck under a sort of flexible cowling uh, that was part of the aperture and then it got stuck in the open position so they weren't able to fully close the aperture through which the sample was pulled into the spacecraft. Now I think, uh, you know, while it was generally successful, if you're an engineer, you have to say that was a bit of a failure. They, they didn't potentially anticipate that problem, and I suppose they should have. So, um, you know, it's their bad at some level. But they did get more sample than they minimum needed. The problem was that as soon as they realized this was stuck open, they realized that some of their material was just gradually drifting out into space. And so they uh, canceled some of their late uh, mission maneuvers that they were going to do, including the mission um, maneuver that would actually have measured how much material they had. They just didn't want to slow down the stowing process. So they went straight. They avoid, They didn't have another touch and go, which they could have done. They could have had a, a second touch and go. And they went straight to the stowing process. Uh, and they lost an indeterminate amount of material during that time. Uh, so in the end, it's not going to be clear when they measure how much they brought back. 
how much they lost and therefore how much more they could have brought back. But I think it's still also clear that they brought back more than the minimum they needed. So in that sense, it was a success. And the samples have been successfully slow stowed in the spacecraft, and the spacecraft will be heading back to Earth to land in late 2023. So the mission is going just fine. The next question from Linda um, is about um, sort of the idea of a center of our universe. Assuming that the universe is both homogeneous and isotropic and started expanding from a subatomic particle, is there any idea as to what direction from Earth that starting point was or could have been? So it's a natural question to ask, but we can't localize the universe as a whole uh, because in this creation event called the Big Bang, when entirety of space-time was folded into a space smaller than a subatomic particle, actually, at the beginning, it's, trip, it's actually formally a singularity, then all space was included in that event. And so space, in a literal sense, if you want to think of a flower unfolding, this is like a flower unfolding or a balloon unfurling in two dimensions, only in this case it's three. And so all space is included in the expanding universe. There's no exterior space that it's expanding into, and there's no reference to an external space. So we're part of the space that the entire universe has been expanding uh, through for 13.8 billion years. And so when we look at neighboring galaxies, they're all moving away from us. But as seen from their perspective, we're moving away from them. And so no galaxy, no point in space can declare itself the center of the expansion because there is no determinable center of the expansion since it obviously is the entire universe participating in it. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, the next question is from one of our live participants. Um, Keith would like to know how close did the small asteroid that uh, passed by Earth on November 2nd come to the Earth? And can you just talk about how close is a close pass on some of these kinds of objects? I think it came less than the Earth-Moon distance. I don't remember the exact number. And that's pretty much the criteria that astronomers and or NASA use for a, a near miss. Anything less than about a quarter of a million miles, so Earth-Moon distance, that's considered a close pass because that's a quarter of a million miles is you know less than 10 Earth circumferences. So that's, that's pretty close, cosmically speaking. Um, and so there was no real danger because the trajectory was also measured in that very accurately. And we knew that it was going to be a close miss, but a miss. There was no confusion about that because your trajectory was fairly well calculated. And that's typically the case. When we see space debris that's in a near-Earth orbit or is an Earth-crossing trajectory, um, computer calculations done with sufficient precision based on observations of sufficient precision can allow a very reliable projection of the trajectory. So we can say, you know, very confidently as anything gets even close to Earth within a few million miles, um, whether or not it's actually going to hit. And that hasn't happened for a very long time. The next question is from John Logix. If we dropped a really long rope into a black hole, uh, would we be able to pull the rope out of the black hole? Um, sensible question. If you want to do an experiment and get something out of a black hole, why not drop a rope or a cable or something? Um, so the answer to the question is just do the thought experiment. If you were at a relatively safe distance from a black hole and you just lowered a rope down into the intense gravity of the black hole, the first problem you have is a very practical one, which is that the tidal force or the stretching force close to the event horizon is sufficient to rip apart a person, which is the spaghettification way that you would die. And so it's definitely going to be more than enough to break a rope. And so I don't want to destroy the question up front, but basically anything that you lowered into a black hole would break because of the tidal forces. So you couldn't do the experiment for that reason. Just imagine you had a super strong material that could, if not get through all the way to the event horizon, could get close. What would happen? As you lowered it, you'd see that the time it appeared to be taking for the rope to reach the event horizon was increasing exponentially and asymptotically approaching in an infinite amount of time. So as seen from your perspective, the bottom end of the tether or the rope would never actually reach the event horizon. So there wouldn't be an issue of pulling something out of the black hole because from your perspective, it never actually went inside. 
Um, the next question is from Kbot Vision. Um, can you discuss the recent finding of the cosmic radio burst source? Um, and if you're not familiar with the recent one, can you talk about what these radio burst sources are and where they come from? Right. Um, there, there's a whole uh, phenomenon called fast radio bursts, and um, they've been known for some years. They're, they're not all one thing, it's sort of like gamma ray bursts, which from decades ago seem to be in different categories, and they reflect different types of cataclysmic events. Uh, fast radio bursts do seem to come from collapsed stars. In some cases, they may be magnetars, highly magnetized very massive stars that when they die, die destructively as sort of a hypernova. Um, so these are sort of transient events associated with material that may fall onto or into a, a very massive, very dense star with a very strong magnetic field. Excellent. Uh, the next question is from Rand Corey, who would like to know, why is it that we only see one side of the moon? We see the same side of the moon all the time because the moon is tidally locked to the Earth. Um, tidal locking occurs when a smaller object is orbiting a larger object, and the distance of the between the objects is relatively small compared to the size of the objects. And that's the case of the Earth's moon because the, the Earth's moon is the largest moon relative to planet size in the solar system, and it's also relatively close to the Earth. So when that happens, the gravitational interaction between the two objects uh, exerts, remember, not just a, a force that keeps it in orbit, but also a stretching force, because there's a difference between the gravity on the front side of the moon and the back side of the moon. And that stretching force, that tidal force, also operates to create tidal locking, because it's essentially the gravity is grabbing that object, the, s the extent of that object in terms of distance from the Earth. And that pull, that stretching force combined with the pull that keeps it in orbit, will align one face always pointing towards the Earth as the object orbits the Earth. And so it just pivots around the Earth with its same face pointing towards us. And that'll be true, you know, far into the future as well. Um, Ayush, who's on with us live, uh, apparently read an article that Nokia is planning to build a 4G network on the moon. Um, can you talk about these kinds of space-based, um, you know, transmitters and receivers or relay stations, and um, why would astronomers be opposed to, you know, various iterations of these, and what are the issues with them? Right. That was in the news a week or so ago, and Nokia doing a, a developing a next-generation Internet. Um, the First of all, the need. The need for Internet uh, within the solar system is quite significant because the spacecraft that we send from Earth are, are quite limited in their telemetry and their ability to send data to and fro between the satellite and Earth or between satel among satellites and then down to the Earth. There's a real bandwidth limit. And so as we start to do more business and more enterprises and more industry in space, we're going to need high bandwidth internet and if we ever have moon bases or mars bases we're going to need interplanetary internet to move signals around efficiently and quickly these simply can't be done with spacecraft as the base so eventually we're going to have to land infrastructure on the moon or mars or put up much more uh, powerful and sophisticated telecommunication satellites to deliver internet beyond the earth so it has its own motivation from the space activity. It's not really connected to terrestrial internet, but of course in the end it is communicating data down to the Earth. Um, so that's what we want to do, and th that's not to be confused with the internet uh, associated with the Starlink constellations. That's a different project. That's a set. Those are low Earth orbit fleets consisting of hundreds and potentially thousands of small telecommunication satellites, which because of their nature, uh, their proximity to the Earth, and the number of them and their size, they reflect quite a lot of uh, ambient light, sunlight at low incidence angles, um, or they have air glow or other glow, uh, and they interfere with astronomical observations. So astronomers are fairly set against too many of these Starlink constellations of satellites, but astronomers are not against and are actually fully in favor of an interplanetary internet to help them do their work too. All right, this next question is from an email, um, but I believe they're getting um, universes and dimensions. Uh, a little confused, I'll read the question as it is and 
we can sort of we can sort that out. I believe string theory predicts 10 universes, although not all of them are large. There have been other theories that predicted more than 10. Have these theories been discarded now in favor of string theory? So again, I believe they mean dimensions. Yeah. So string theory is a multidimensional theory. It has multidimensional space times that's built into the mathematics. Um, and the, the explanation for why these dimensions might not be obvious in our universe are that all but the three dimensions of space and one of time that we are familiar with are only accessible or visible or diagnosable on incredibly small scales or incredibly high energies or temperatures. And so they're just, they're not perceived by us because we live in a low energy universe and we operate at low energies. So that's how string theory can postulate dimensions which can in practice be hidden. As for the number dimensions, that really depends. String theory is not one thing. It's a whole miniature universe of theories and it was expanded some years ago to actually go from string theory to what's called M theory, M dash theory, where M stands for membrane. And that's just the general class of multidimensional space times that can be used as a fundamental theory of particles and, of course, of the universe we live in. None of them have been tested and shown to be correct and shown to be applicable to our universe. And it's also hard to distinguish between the various numbers of dimensions in these string theories, especially given that the number of the extra dimensions are all invisible to us and not diagnosable by any lab experiment. So there's a high degree of uncertainty about the string theory that might be most appropriate or whether they actually work at all to explain fundamental physics. The next question is from one of our live viewers. Uh, Ryan Weber would like to know, Light traveling across the universe is stretched or redshifted by the expanding universe. Is there a direct relationship in scale? Could you age date light by measuring how stretched it is? Uh, absolutely. That's what the redshift is. So, so the statement is correct. As light travels through the universe at 300,000 kilometers per second, space-time is expanding. And the wave of light, the electromagnetic disturbance that constitutes light, is being stretched because if you measure its wavelength, you're measuring a spatial dimension, and the spatial dimensions of space-time are altering with time. And so the wavelength of light as it travels through the universe directly reflects the expansion of space-time. And so to put numbers on that, uh, the highest redshift that we can see on, in terms of quasars or galaxies of far away in the universe is about 12 or 12 and a half billion light years. And that corresponds to a redshift of about n 9 or 10 is the record. And a redshift of 10 means that the light has been stretched by a factor of 10. It's actually 1 plus 10, 1 plus z, um, since the light was emitted. So when we see a very high redshift galaxy or quasar, we're looking at light that when it was emitted uh, was short ultraviolet wavelengths and then was stretched by a factor of 10 to go into the visible light range that we collect. Um, and so. It's a very direct relationship. Another example of this is the microwave background radiation. That's the relic radiation from the Big Bang released into the universe when atoms became neutral and the temperature was low enough, about 3,000 Kelvin, for electrons to combine with protons to form stable hydrogen atoms. And the universe became transparent, and so the radiation could travel freely. That was a time that was uh, 400,000 years after the Big Bang, uh, and the redshift was 1,000. And that means that the radiation since that time has been traveling through space-time for 13.8 billion years almost and has stretched by a factor of 1,000 or been redshifted by a factor of 1,000. And so something that was equivalent to a thermal temperature of 3,000 degrees, which is roughly red light, dull red light, has been stretched by a factor of 1,000. And you stretch red light waves by a factor of a thousand, you get microwaves. And that's how we saw that radiation. Uh, the next question is from Jean-Pierre Sagbini. Um, the expansion of the universe has been observed relatively recently in our history. Um, are the few years of observations um, enough to be sure of our theories? What if the universe, for example, had a cycle with a frequency of billions of years, expansion and contraction? That's indeed possible. Uh, so the, the good thing about doing cosmology as an observer is that the universe is a time machine. So when you look out in space, you're looking back in time. 
And so we can measure the expansion rate of the universe right now by looking at nearby galaxies and seeing how fast they are moving away from us. And, and we can generate a Hubble law, which is a relationship between their distance from us and their recession velocity. And so that's the expansion rate of the universe now in the recent past. But we can also look far out into the universe and see at much higher redshifts and much larger distances what the expansion rate is. And so it was the agenda of astronomy, actually starting in the 60s and 70s, to measure the, measure the expansion history of the universe uh, by looking out through space and back in time. The expectation anticipation was we'd see that the universe has decelerated in time, over time due to dark matter, but the surprise from 1995, of course, was that the universe is currently accelerating. So the expansion rate's getting faster over time because of dark energy. So this whole business of measuring the expansion history of the universe is a very fundamental tool for doing cosmology. All right, uh, the next question is from uh, Peter, who would like to know, we know that the sun and other stars are fusion reactors. Um, how far is it practical to reproduce nuclear fusion on Earth? It's very hard. Um, so the sun and other stars like the sun are exercising fusion in a stable fusion reactor, essentially. The sun is a stable star. And just by its sheer mass in the interior, where the temperature is above about 10 million Kelvin, the inner quarter in radius of the sun, um, so the inner 64th, if you like, of the volume of the sun, these are regions hot enough for fusion in a three-step process to make helium out of hydrogen. And the sun does that all the time, has done it for four and a half billion years, and will do it for another four billion years, roughly. So that's fusion in the universe and in the sun. On Earth, it's exceptionally difficult to do. First of all, containing something that has temperature of a million degrees is impossible because all materials melt or vaporize at temperatures of 10, 20,000 degrees. So a magnetic bottle is used, and so there are magnetic containment devices that are required to make fusion operate. And it's very hard to get stability of the plasma, the very high temperature gas, while you're compressing it, because you have to compress it to force protons to fuse together and get energy out by fusion. And basically the short answer is that in decades of doing this work and investments of hundreds of millions, actually tens of billions of dollars in the United States and equal amounts in Europe and Japan, a fusion, a chain, you know, a sustainable fusion reaction has only been made to occur for tiny fractions of a second, I think about a billionth of a second. It's absolutely not sustainable in the way that the sun is a sustainable energy reactor. So these obstacles are really quite formidable. So it's just a technology problem. And at the moment, given the rate at which renewable energy sources like wind and solar are getting cheaper and now rivaling fossil fuels, it's actually really unlikely that uh, fusion will get enough investment for it ever to be a viable technology. Uh, the next question is from Oscar Garcia, who would like to know, have we already reached the limit of what is feasible on design and construction of optical terrestrial telescopes, or are there still advances to be made? I think there are advances to be made, but they're getting a little harder. So the biggest generation of upcoming telescopes is in the 20 to 40 meter class. Um, so we in Arizona are building a 22 and a half meter telescope in Chile. The uh, Caltech and the University of California are building a 30 meter telescope, they hope on Mauna Kea, and the Europeans are building a closer to 40 meter telescope in Chile. These are the three big telescopes that are being built. And it's very hard to go much bigger than a factor of two or maybe 50 percent bigger than that because the structures become very large, they become heavy, the fabrication costs and the overall costs just start to get really high. The only real way to do better is to have fundamentally uh, cheaper technology or lighter mirrors. Uh, now that can be done in space. Astronomers have used beryllium mirrors, but beryllium obviously extremely light element, also fragile when you fabricate it into a curved surface. So for fragile, expensive, and valuable space telescopes, you can use beryllium, but on the Earth, it's not really a sturdy enough material to make a beryllium mirror and to make a mosaic of them. 
Uh, so at the moment, there's no plan for any telescope much larger than 40 meters. So 50 and possibly 100 engineering drawings exist because Europeans at one point were considering something called OWL, overwhelmingly large telescope, and that was specced at 100 meters originally, the size of a football field. It's kind of amazing. Um, and the engineering drawings exist, but when they started costing out the technologies to build it, they realized they didn't have enough money to ever do that. So it feels like we're approaching a natural limit here. The only way to exempt ourselves from that natural limit would be go to a place that's easier to do optical astronomy, and that would be the far side of the moon. Obviously not easier to get there and go there and build there, but once you had infrastructure uh, sufficient to create fabrication there, 3D printing or building structures or telescope mirrors, uh, it's a very stable, high quality environment, less gravity, just a place where you could eventually build a super large telescope. The next question is from Andrew Johnson, who's on with us uh, live. Massive spinning compact objects curve and twist space-time. How fast does this twisting occur and what effects would there be at the wrinkles? So the, the torsion uh, applied by a spinning compact object to space-time is significant. Um, you can work out in general relativity the, the twisting of the space-time contours. Uh, and it doesn't, it doesn't sort of wrap around the object multiple times uh, like you might imagine if you were twirling a tape around a spinning object, it just wraps around it again and again and again. It's a fairly subtle effect. It's a slight deviation of a trajectory angle associated with a spinning object. So it's actually very subtle. It's about one part in a million, actually, in terms of a deflection angle. Um, now that deflection is still measurable, and the uh, Gravity Probe B was able to measure this geodetic effect, as it's called, on the, from the Earth, the gravity of the Earth, and Earth's not a compact object by any means. Uh, so even though it's a very subtle effect, it has been measured, and it should be easier to measure around objects like neutron stars or black holes. But I will just say that the experiments we've done with colliding neutron stars and black holes using gravitational waves are not actually directly sensitive to this effect, so they're not measuring it. All right, there are two questions that are sort of related. Um, Steve, uh, who's on with us live, would like to know if planets emit in infrared and stars emit invisible light, wouldn't more massive objects be capable of emitting in the X-ray spectrum? Um, so the emission spectrum or, or thermal radiation of an object, which is just, just reflects its temperature, it's the smooth so-called black body radiation in physics terms. So it's a, it's a broad spectrum with a characteristic temperature. Uh, a characteristic wavelength that relates to the temperature linearly. And so an object at a, with a temperature of thousands of Kelvin will radiate in the visible range, and the surface of the sun is a perfect example. An object with a surface temperature of a few hundred Kelvin, like a planet in our solar system, a terrestrial planet, will radiate at a wavelength 10 times longer, which is the near-infrared. And so that's relationship. Uh, to imagine what kind of an object would emit at x-rays, or ultraviolet, then it's clearly much shorter wavelength, so much hotter temperature, and the temperatures would be hundreds of thousands or millions of Kelvin. So the only objects we know of like that, of course, are stars, extremely hot stars, actually. The hottest white dwarfs get up to about 100,000 Kelvin. Um, and then the only other objects that can get to that temperature are not stars themselves, but the accretion disks that sometimes form around stars or compact objects those accretion disks can have temperatures uh, as much as a few million Kelvin, and so they would emit in x-rays. Excellent, thank you very much. And uh, Wendy um, asked, uh, I think, a related question that I believe was already answered. Um, can you talk about why different forms of electromagnetic radiation are used for studying different astronomical objects and with some examples? So if there's anything like you'd like to add to what you already said, um, you can just, maybe sure just generally the astronomers like to use the full electromagnetic spectrum to learn about the universe because each portion of the electromagnetic spectrum diagnoses or accesses different types of information so the visible part of the spectrum is the a plate spectrum is where of course stars emit most of their energy it's also where the spectroscopic features associated with most atoms 
uh, exist, and so that's how we do spectroscopy to learn how something's what something's made of. So optical astronomy is very central to that. Uh, longer wavelengths, we have infrared, and infrared, of course, is the realm where planets will do most of their radiating. It's also the realm where uh, larger entities emitting spectral features like molecules will emit. So if you're looking for molecular lines and trying to diagnose mole molecules in space or in a planetary atmosphere or anywhere, you'll use infrared techniques. And as you go to even longer wavelengths, the same is true. So millimeter wave astronomy also involves looking at the rotation modes of molecules in cold regions like star forming regions, and that's what molecular spectroscopy is used for. And then millimeter uh, observations and submillimeter observations are used for looking at the coldest regions of space, like 10 to 50 to 100 Kelvin, typically places where stars will form. And at the other extreme, of course, we have uh, ultraviolet, which is accretion disks and extremely hot stars, X-rays, which is the corona of normal stars like the sun, which has a temperature of a few million degrees and emits X-rays, uh, extremely hot regions around stars, uh, gravitational energy leading to accretion disks. Those have temperatures of a million or a few degrees. Um, and there's not much that emits gamma rays because then they're not, not talking about thermal radiation at all. They're talking about particle acceleration, typically by a black hole in an active galaxy. Excellent. The next question is from Daniel Geva, who would like to know how many satellites can occupy a single Lagrange point? It's a Lagrange points are, especially if they're unstable equilibrium Lagrange points, uh, which are the ones that are, tend to be used for astronomy, um, th there's not a point in the sky. It's obviously some region. And since it's unstable, if you put something there, you have to have small retro rockets to be able to move it and nudge it back to the center of the Lagrange point. So in practical terms, because space is large, and the Lagrange point is not an actual point because it's unstable, so you're going to be moving around near the Lagrange point and reorienting yourself. I would say it would be dozens and dozens and dozens of satellites, maybe hundreds, before you consider any single Lagrange point of the Earth-Moon-Sun system to be crowded. And the most we've ever had is like a handful of missions. The next question is from one of our emails. Um, what is the largest celestial body in the universe? And I guess I will sort of add, you know, maybe multiple body and single object. The largest or and or most massive single object in the universe that I know of, um, I mean, if we're talking about a stellar system, then it's the largest galaxy. So we have giant elliptical galaxies where the total mass, where the number of stars is hundreds of billions, where the total mass is a couple of trillion solar masses. So in terms of single gravitating objects, there are giant elliptical galaxies of that order. If you're talking about the largest single object of any kind, then the answer is a massive black hole. I think the current black hole record breaker, just established about a year or so ago, is about 40, million, 40 billion times the mass of the sun. So that's a black hole at the center of a giant galaxy um, where that black hole itself has the mass of a small galaxy, which is extraordinary. A 40 billion solar mass black hole is, has an event horizon that's about 20 times the size of the solar system. And that's an object that's probably rotating about a third the speed of light. So something that's 10 or 15 times the size of the solar system is spinning so fast that its event horizon uh, is going around once every few months, the same speed as Mercury going around the sun, which is extraordinary. Uh, the next question is, um, and I will embellish a little bit, um, the question is from Harmon, who's on with us live, what are your views on the multiple realities as in Schrodinger's cat experiment? But then I think that begs the question, what are your views on the two different sort of interpretations of uh, quantum mechanics? Mm -hmm. So the Schrodinger's cat experiment is a thought experiment, a hypothetical experiment. Physicists don't tend to want to kill cats. They're fairly humane people. Um, it was an experiment where you set up this artificial situation where a cat is in a sealed box and there's a radioactive source which has a 50% probability of, of emitting a particle within a fixed period of time. If it emits the particle, 
it drops a hammer that smashes a cyanide vial which will kill the cat and if it doesn't fall the cat survives and the question is in advance of looking at the outcome or during the experiment when you can't see into the box how do you describe the state of the cat and once you look inside one way or the other the cat is either alive or dead but the, after the experiment is concluded before you look in the outcome must exist that it, either the cat has been alive or the cat is dead <clears throat> the question is how do you describe it in the standard interpretation of quantum mechanics the only logical way to describe the cat is half live and half dead because that is the probability assigned to either outcome and both outcomes are possible until they're measured so that's the standard or Copenhagen interpretation of that experiment the non-standard interpretation or perhaps the one that Einstein preferred was the one that, that adheres to sort of hidden variables that I, the, the idea that the uncertainty or indeterminacy of quantum theory is an artifact of the theory and that there's some more advanced theory or super theory in which certainty is reestablished and so he would imagine that there's a superior theory in which you could know the outcome of the experiment although he couldn't say why that was in this thought experiment so that's sort of how uncertainty plays into the Schrodinger cat idea. Um, the next question is from one of our live viewers who would like to know, um, I'm sorry, just got a little twisted up here in my list of questions. Um, oh, um, Heavenlicious has asked several times, and I will just mention that please ask your questions only once. We'll try to get to them as, as we can. But I would like to know if it's possible um, to grow plants on the moon or if we could grow, if anyone's ever tried to grow plants in outer space. Um, well, there have been modest plant growing experiments on the International Space Station. So, you know, the, the space station astronauts do various microgravity experiments, and some of them have involved plants and, and animals, of course, and so on. So. Uh, but no long-term plant growing experiments have been done in the space station so really that hasn't been done um, you could grow plants on the moon but not naturally obviously that the lunar soil is is so deficient in in the minerals and nutrients that a plant would need forget about the, the water that you would have to add to it that there's no way in the lunar regolith to grow plants um, so they're not going to grow naturally uh, you would if you wanted to grow plants on the moon, you'd actually have to either import soil and replenish it, or you'd have to use a hydroponic method, which typically uses concentrated nutrients and water and doesn't require soil. And that's likely the way they would do it on the moon. And so designs for how to do that have been around for a while, and I think that's pretty much how uh, people would operate on the moon. Excellent. Uh, the next question is from one of our emails. Um, again, let me make sure that I... Oh, um, we get this question periodically. Um, there are people who are interested in how they get into the field of astronomy, either from, you know, like trying to get an undergraduate degree to get into astronomy or they already have a degree in some field and maybe want to pivot to astronomy. Would you be able to talk a little mm -hmm. bit about mm -hmm. how that um, how that can be done and what your recommendations are? Right. If you're not in astronomy and wanting to start, then you, your best bet is an undergraduate degree program in either physics or physics and astronomy or astronomy. All, all three of those possibilities exist. At the University of Arizona, for example, we have an astronomy major and a physics major. Most of our astronomy majors are double majors in physics as well because they're already doing about two-thirds or three-quarters of that coursework and they figure that a astronomy bachelor and a physics bachelor gives them more employment opportunities and that's probably a true statement. So it's easy to get into astronomy with a physics degree. I had an undergraduate physics degree. That's the standard route in fact because there are not that many undergraduate uh, astronomy programs. So that's the way you get in uh, from a base of physics and that gradually the astronomy is layered in in the program and then if you go to graduate school in astronomy you get a specialist training in astrophysics at the graduate level and that's all you'll ever need in terms of formal education. Uh, if you already have a degree in another subject and say it's not a degree in physics or astronomy um, then it's a little more complicated. 
we definitely have, and other peer institutions like ours with good graduate programs, have definitely admitted students whose first degrees were math, applied math, uh, occasionally biology, because students may want to work in astrobiology, and even more rarely electrical engineering um, or optical engineering, for example, perhaps someone who wants to work on astronomical instruments. So it's not a huge number of possible degrees that make it not too hard to go into a graduate program in astronomy, but you will have some deficiencies to make up. You may have to take extra graduate courses. Um, the, the standard route is still physics as an undergraduate degree and then astronomy or astrophysics as the PhD. The next question is from Chopin Beethoven. Uh, what caused matter and antimatter to separate at the Big Bang? Well, in the initial part of the expansion, they were not separated. So p matter and antimatter were created from pure radiation. So remember, until the 10,000 years after the Big Bang, radiation dominated the dynamics of the expanding universe. Um, and that radiation was freely able to make particles and antiparticles all the time. Now, those particles would fly around, and if they then subsequently met an equivalent antiparticle, they would disappear back into radiation. But the radiation dominated. So particles and antiparticles were being made in equal numbers, uh, balanced, uh, and that was the situation very early on. Now, what happened, apparently, we infer, because we don't see antimatter in the universe, is that there must have been a very slight asymmetry in the creation process really early on, by which I mean the first fraction of a second, that led, for example, to a slight excess of quarks over antiquarks and a slight excess of electrons over positrons, such that when the universe cooled so that particle-antiparticle pairs could no longer be created from pure radiation, because there wasn't enough energy, then the existing particles and antiparticles annihilated and a very small residue of particles was left over to form the material contents of our universe. That's the inference of what happened, because we see a universe with essentially no antimatter, with a certain amount of matter, particles, and about hundreds of millions or a billion times more photons than particles of any kind. So radiation was part of this equation, and we're just seeing the radiation left over from the final annihilation of the particles and antiparticles, with the slight excess of particles left over. All right. Um, the next question is from Papa Franku, um, who would like to know, if you were able to digitize a copy of your consciousness and you were able to upload that to a synthetic body, do you think that it would actually be you, or would it cease to be you once, uh, once you died? I mean, that's a profound question. It's not my specialty either, though I've read about these subjects. Um, at the moment, it's entirely hypothetical uh, for the simple reason that we don't understand consciousness. So we don't understand the mechanism of consciousness. So it's the, it's the mind-brain uh, problem. We have a dichotomy, if you like, between the brain, a physical object with electrochemical networks and neurons and certain amount of activity that we, we can measure in great detail. That's the brain, the physical brain. And then we have the mind, or the, the seat of consciousness, and our awareness and our sense of self. And we don't know exactly how they relate or how the mind m emerges from the physical medium of the brain. Until we understand how that happens, then it's actually premature to even imagine that we could take some version, some digitized version of our consciousness and upload it to another substrate or another medium or a, or a storage device of some kind. It simply may not be possible. The consciousness uh, that we experience and sense of self may be so dynamically generated and evanescent that it simply disappears when there's no physical brain. And that would, of course, imply that after we die, that's all over. There's no, nothing to capture, nothing to save, nothing to store. And, re and reanimate. That's a possibility, or maybe it is possible that we can do this with sufficient technology and sufficient understanding of how the brain relates to the mind. But I would say we are decades away from that kind of an understanding at the moment. These are exciting f fields of science, but they're very early in their evolution. Um, all right, uh, the next question is from, um, one of our live viewers, hypothetically, if we knew for sure that the universe is now flat and infinite in size, 
Was it therefore infinite in size at the time of the Big Bang, and therefore never subatomic particle size? No, the inference of the fact that the universe is flat is that that fact supports the inflationary idea. Because otherwise there's no reason why our universe should be flat since it should have been very highly curved near the beginning when it was very dense and the gravity was very strong. So the fact that we see the universe to be flat begs for an explanation because it corresponds to fine tuning that we really don't explain in a standard Big Bang. So it has become part of the inflationary idea attached to the Big Bang, the standard Big Bang, that says that the universe underwent exponential, extraordinarily rapid inflationary growth very early on, first tiny fraction of a second, and that's what led space to be fundamentally flat. So reversing the logic, it's because of the inflationary idea uh, posited to explain flatness uh, and also some other features of our universe that we infer that it, there was an early stage when space was highly curved that something happened to render it flat, and that thing was inflation. All right, uh, sorry, I'm filtering through a few questions. Um, there have been a couple of questions that have come up. Um, a couple of people have, have asked uh, if there is an update on the uh, phosphine gas discovery on Venus, um, but also um, people who are sort of new, who haven't been here for a couple of weeks, who would just like, if, like you to talk about the discovery of phosphine on Venus and what it means um, for, uh, you know, sort of in the larger right. picture. And this will be our last question for today. Yeah, I'll, I'll do it briefly because we have had this a few times. There's no recent research result that I know of in terms of analysis of that detection. So the detection is of phosphine, a small molecule that's associated with biological processes on the Earth. Note I say associated with because we don't actually know, biologists don't actually know where, what role phosphine plays in fundamental biochemical processes. That's not known. It's just known that phosphine is found in association with life on Earth. And so seeing phosphine in the mid-level decks of the atmosphere of Venus suggests that perhaps there are biological activity there. There's biological mechanisms in place or life or some living creatures microbial, presumably, in the atmosphere of Venus. And it's a very exciting inference or discovery if it's true, but remember, the discovery is not that. The discovery is just of a single unusual molecule that on Earth is associated with life. In Venus, we don't know what it's associated with. Geologists say that phosphine can be occurring naturally. It's possible under certain circumstances, but it's very unusual and certainly not likely under the conditions of the Venusian atmosphere. So geologists tend to agree that if phosphine is there in Venus, it's not associated with geological or natural processes and therefore maybe it does have a biological origin. We simply don't know how. And the true answer to the question is not going to be for more analysis of the data they've already got because it won't tell us anything fundamentally new. It's going to actually take new sampling of the Venusian atmosphere, which is going to take a space probe to Venus, and NASA is actually moving fairly quickly for NASA along a path to take an existing concept and adapt it to a Venusian atmospheric probe that would be able to sniff out phosphine and other molecules associated with life. Those missions could possibly go if one is selected as soon as three or four years from now. And that's a good question to end with, and uh, appreciate your patience for our late start, and we'll be with you next week again. Thanks to Matthew and Alexander for getting us ready for this session. Uh, everyone stay safe. So bye.